Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar, How to Become a Project Management Leader. I am Suzanne Matson, and I will be taking you through this webinar. I expect to be talking for about 45 to 50 minutes, and then there will be questions. So please do type in any questions into the chat box that you have along the way, and our moderator will come back at the end of the webinar and um, raise some of those questions to me. So um, please do bear that in mind. We like to get questions at the end. Okay, so what am I going to cover today? Well, we will look at, of course, how you can become more of a leader uh, in your project management work. We will look at the differences between management and leadership. And in particular, we will delve into emotional intelligence because that's one of the main differentiators, really, between a leader and a manager. We will also look at how you can plan collaboratively, how you can create a high-performing team, and also what the six human needs are that we all have and that your team members have, plus many other things, but they are some of the highlights. A little bit about myself. I am calling in today from London, where I have lived for the last 17 years. I have a, um, well, I have a background as a project manager and program manager in technology and in finance. But really, what I find would be a more useful introduction to you is how I come to present to you right now. And I have to take you back to 2008. In 2008, I was running a very large project for one of the banks in London, and we had about 50 people on that project, and the survival of the business stream I was working in depended on my project. So you can imagine that I felt quite a lot of pressure, honestly. And I had been working under high-intensity uh, pressure for probably about two years, to the point where I think I was, I was seriously facing burnout. And um, I was very lucky to be invited to attend a leadership course for five days. And what I remember from that leadership course isn't so much the different um, leadership things or um, models that we went through, but I remember in particular the one-on-one -on -one coaching that we each had. I was being coached for one hour, and within that one hour, I had a complete aha moment. I basically realized that the way I was managing projects was not really um, to my benefit or to my team's benefit. I realized that by changing my ways, I could not only become more effective, I could also avoid burnout. And it's very, it's a, it sounds a bit corny that I realized that, well, that I had this aha moment, but I really realized that I had a choice and that I could change. And it's a very, very powerful feeling when, when you get, get that feeling, because up until that point, I thought project management is stressful. If you don't like it, you can quit. But, but this really changed me, and I got so interested in coaching that I decided to become a coach. So in 2009, I qualified as a coach, and I began to coach project managers in parallel with my day job. But about, um, well, and, and at that point, actually, I wrote my first book, the Project Management Coaching Workbook. But I, I soon realized that that was something I wanted to do full time. So about four and a half years ago, I left my full-time employment as a project manager, and uh, now I run leadership workshops for project managers, and I do a lot of coaching one-on-one -on -one as well. And I wrote my second book in 2005, The Power of Project Leadership. Um, if you want to know more, of course, check out my website, SuzanneMatson.com. I'm also on Twitter, and I would, I would love for you to connect with me on LinkedIn. However, um, let's crack on with uh, this leadership topic within project management. Now, I'm not the only one talking about leadership. Um, thankfully, the project management industry is now beginning to focus more on it, because if you take a traditional project management course, leadership has a very, very small place. 
and I would like to change that. This uh, screenshot here is from the PMI's Pulse report, and uh, their question is, um, you know, what's the most important skill to successfully manage highly complex projects? And 81% of those who responded actually came back and said leadership skills over and above technical project management skills and strategic and business uh, management skills. And I would like you to consider for a moment which, which of these statements is most correct. Is it, number one, leaders are visionary, inspiring, and concerned with events and processes? Is it number two, leaders value others, ask challenging questions, and empower others? Or is it leaders are risk takers, have a high degree of emotional intelligence, and use a push approach to getting things done? There is some truth in each of these statements, of course, but I wonder what your judgment is. Now, to my mind, it's the second statement that's the most correct. Leaders do value others, they ask challenging questions, and they do empower others. What's really wrong with the first statement is this events and processes, and what's wrong with the third statement is this push approach. That really belongs more to management. So let's look then at the differences between management and leadership. We have management here on the left-hand side. And you may have seen this before. Management is very task-oriented. It's something that can be learned. It's about skills and processes and about getting things right or wrong. There's, there's often a right or a wrong answer. Like you can calculate something. You can um, you know, just consider the terminology we use in project management. Um, we calculate effort and estimate duration. It's all very specific with a right or wrong answer. In management as well, we use our authority. We have people report to us and we tell those people how to do things. But that means that we have to know it all as a project manager because we're instructing others, or at least if we have that management approach. When you instruct others, I really call that a push approach. It is me telling you how to do things. And, and that requires a lot of cognitive intelligence. Now, in contrast, let's look at leadership. Leadership is very people-oriented. It's not so much about my specific behaviors, or sorry, my specific knowledge, as it is my behaviors. I'm more motivational, inspiring, visionary. People matter to me. I need people. It's not about me, but about we. I ask more questions. I take more risks. I empower others, I draw people into the equation. I know that I do not have all the answers on my own. So I call this for a pull approach. And emotional intelligence is really important for leaders. You can probably think of some very good managers you work with. They were good at following processes, they were good at making sure that people got stuff done, but they didn't really have a feel for people. Their emotional intelligence just wasn't there. Leadership, it is very difficult to think of a good leader who doesn't have a good amount of emotional intelligence. So I would like to spend a little bit more time looking into emotional intelligence. What is it really? And what you see here is a bit of a model with some boxes, and um, we can't put boxes on everything, of course, but it can help us to look at something that is complex in a more simple way. So please excuse the boxes. We have on the left-hand side something to do with yourself, yeah? And on the right-hand side something to do with others. So how do you relate to yourself and how do you relate to others? The top slice, the two top boxes, are more awareness-related and the bottom ones are more management-related. So let's, let's look at where this gets us by starting with self-awareness, the top left-hand um, cluster here. Now, all leadership begins with self-awareness. How can you begin to lead others if you're not aware of yourself, if you're not aware of what has formed you as a leader, and also if you're not aware of what is happening to you in any given moment? What I mean is, um, many of us just really live in our thinking brain. We think we're rational, but we've cut off all our emotions, or we think we have. So we're not so aware of when we feel anger or sadness or joy or fear. And when we're not aware, we let that come through in 
our dealings with other people. So we, we, we're not conscious about it. So a leader need to be, needs to be conscious and very aware of what they're feeling in any given moment. Because when you learn to express yourself directly and you know what you're feeling, you can begin to, to be more clear in how, how you express yourself to others. Then we also prevent misunderstandings. You're clear about your own standpoint, so you can be clear about how to, what you need to communicate to others. But, but how can you begin to develop self-awareness? Well, you can begin to journal. So journaling really means that at the end of each day you reflect on how your day went, what you felt, what you did, what you didn't do. So it's really pausing and reflecting and capturing that in a journal. Also, if you work with a coach, that coach can help you to increase your level of self-awareness. Now let's move down to self-management. Self-management is really what you do with those emotions that you feel as a manager and leader. Because let's be clear, um, you need both. Okay, In project management, you need leadership as well as management. I'm definitely not here to tell you you should throw all your management away. Not at all. You need both aspects. But self-management is really about choosing your response to different situations. So, for instance, um, if you feel anger, leadership is not about suppressing your anger. It is not also not about showing your anger full on. No, it's about choosing what is appropriate in any given moment, which you can only do if you're aware. You've probably worked with leaders who completely lost it. Well, maybe they were not a good example of a good leader, but but they could not control themselves. Or other leaders or managers who didn't show anything. That's also not um, a good example of a good leader. Good leaders need to show what's appropriate in any given moment. So how can you begin to develop your self-management and to choose the appropriate response in any given situation? Well, really it's about pausing and reflecting. So if you get really angry or wound up by something and you're just about to send that email, don't do it. Press that pause button because what's happened is that there are some emotions in your brain that have taken a hold on you. And as long as the emotional brain is in action, you won't be able to think clearly. So you need to wait until you calm down. So leave that email in the inbox overnight and have a, have a look at it the next morning. The same goes if you're with someone in a meeting or someone comes up to you and you feel frustrated or angry, um, just pause. Just pause for a moment. Say to people, you know what, I'll consider it, I'll get back to you, because then you have a moment to reflect and to choose the appropriate response. Social awareness, top of right hand, is extremely important also for leadership. So social awareness is how aware are you of other people? How aware are you of what other people are feeling, your team members? What's really happening for them at the moment? People on your project are not just there to be resources in your plan. They're actually there as human beings, right? And in the moment, we'll look at high-performing teams. We need to really relate to other people. Um, I really personally developed this area a lot when I took my coaching uh, diplomas. And that's one way you can develop your social awareness is really on, and, and your empathy is by being, becoming a better listener and becoming better at asking questions also. And then the last one, relationship management. We tend to focus a lot on this in um, project management leadership, how to build good relationships with your stakeholders, um, how to engage your team members, but really know that it is built on the other three boxes here. But what you can do um, to build strong relationships is you can have more one-on-ones, uh, become more aware of how to build trust is something we'll talk about later in this webinar. Include people, have an inclusive approach, engage and tailor your communication to different people. There's a lot of different ways you can build strong relationships. We're going to focus on quite a few of those in this webinar. Now, I would like to know how good your leadership skills and emotional and intelligence skills are. From experience, most people will say that they don't really have a problem here. They will say that, no, no, it's okay, I'm, I'm fine, um, no problem. And that's really often a bit of a blind spot. 
it's like people who think that they're brilliant communicators, but there are misunderstandings around them all the time. So the only way that you can really get an answer to this question, how good are your leadership skills and your emotional intelligence skills, is by asking for feedback. Good leaders ask for feedback because they know that other people can reflect back on them and that is a way to understand our blind spots. So I propose and encourage you to ask these three questions to people who you work with, to people who you um, respect. What should I continue to do? What should I start doing? What should I stop doing? Three very simple but very very effective questions. Now we're going to delve in into much more detail on how to connect with people and build trust but before we do we do need to emphasize that project management leadership of course is also about results right so I just want to bring up this uh, triangle which we should all know it's the good old-fashioned time cost quality triangle of course our projects must be delivered on time within budget and to the stated quality yeah we must deliver what we specified there is nothing new there um, not so far anyway a good project manager is traditionally somebody who could deliver to this triangle but we're not just talking project management here we are talking project management leadership and I really want to add another triangle on top here with some further dimensions that also need to be in place in order for us to really be successful project management leaders. We need to also deliver a project and a project that has an effect on the company's strategic objectives. So if you are delivering a new IT system or a new building on time cost quality, you also need to ask, what is the effect of this project on my customers strategic objectives so it's really the question of so what what do they gain from this what is the value add and also what is the relevance to the users is this relevant at all and sustainability is this project sustainable and the word sustainable this element of course can mean different things it can mean that it's durable or it can mean that the uh, materials that you're using are sustainable it's only when you consider all of these aspects, both of these triangles, that you can truly say that you are delivering value and that you are successful as a project management leader. It is not good enough to simply look at time cost quality. You also need to be concerned with the business case. I'm not saying that you're solely responsible for the business case because we do of course have a sponsor as well, but you are co-responsible yeah, I've, I've written a blog post on this, uh, I think it's probably about two years ago now. It caused outrage on LinkedIn. How would I, how could I dare say that project managers were responsible for the business case? But in fact, I'm saying you're co-responsible. Yeah, it's not enough to just be concerned with time cost quality. Now we've got that one clear, let's go back to the people element because it's the people who will help you deliver those projects that add value, of course. It's people who deliver projects. So just a few specifics here. How do you do it? Well, it's really about prioritizing people. You know, I know quite a few project managers, when a team member enters their office, they will kind of listen to them with half an ear. They're not paying people full attention. They're not even turning their chair around. How can you then really begin to connect properly with your team? You can't. So it's about prioritizing people, giving them your full attention, uh, having one-on-one -on -one meetings, not just for your benefit, but to their benefit. What do they need from you? How can you help them is a way that I would like you to start considering this. And really understanding what is it that a team member would like more of or less of in their job? What is it that they like most or least about their job? Anyone is able to answer that question. I ran a, a session with a consultancy, the top uh, 12 leaders of a consultancy, and they all sat around the table. Each person wrote down on three post-it notes, what do I like the most about my job on one post-it note? 
what do I like the least about my job on another post-it note? And on the third post-it, they wrote, what would I do even if I didn't get a salary for it? And they shared that with each other around the table, and that was really a way that they began to bond and connect better with each other and got a much better understanding of what was important to each of them and how they could use that to their benefit. Asking questions, of course, is a big one and admitting that you don't have all the answers, that is absolutely key. Planning collaboratively is one of those tools that you can begin to use um, very successfully. I know pro many project managers who say, no, planning, we know planning, that's my job. I plan and I tell my team what to do, of course. I ask for input when I put the plan together. But that is not the same as collaborative planning. I'll show you now three simple steps you can use when you plan collaboratively with your team. If you are all co-located, get your team together. And um, at this point, you may have a brief, you may have requirements. But this first step is really to sit in your, in your team, with the team members, and brainstorming everything that needs to get done on post-it note. Um, one item per post-it note. Once you've got everything on the table, you can begin to arrange it either in a product uh, breakdown structure or just here where you group it and find um, different work streams. So the work streams here at the top with the pink post-its and everything else that needs to get done, one item per post-it note below it. And then we get to the third step here where you have your timeline at the top, you have your work streams on the left-hand on the left-hand side, and then you have your post-its, which is the things that need to get done um, on the timeline aligned to one of the work streams. This is, of course, a very high-level plan. Um, at this stage, it may not be accurate at all. But it is an extremely good starting point because you get everybody around the table to work on it. And it's fun. And people feel that they're being listened to and they have a stake in the project. From this point, of course, when you have this high-level plan, you can begin to choose your top 10 milestones. You can draw arrows that illustrate dependencies. You can assign an owner to each poster note. You can do so much more. But this is obviously just a starting point and a really good way to engage your team. Yeah, I, I, I use it a lot in training scenarios. And it really gets a group gelling, even if it's uh, participants who don't, who don't know each other beforehand. And then I would like you to ask yourself or to imagine that your team consisted of volunteers. You can do that right now. Imagine that your team were volunteers. If they were, meaning that they came to work even if they didn't get paid for it, what would make each person turn up? Maybe one person is so keen to work in spreadsheets that they would, you know, just do that all day without getting paid for it. And another person just loves to sell and loves to connect with people. And if they have a role where they, where they get to do that, they're just really happy. I'm not for any moment suggesting that you shouldn't pay your people. I'm just saying that it's useful to think about what makes each person tick and what would make them go to work even if they didn't get a salary for it. This ties in with the six human needs that we all have. I will now share these six human needs with you. These are needs that go below and that are deeper than just money, for instance. Many studies show that money is only a motivator to the point where you have enough money, then it ceases to be a good motivator. So the six human needs I will share with you now really go deep. We all have these six human needs, needs more or less, right, in different, in different amounts. So the first one is certainty. We all have a need for certainty. We want to know that we're being paid. We want to know that we are um, safe in our homes, we want to know that we have a role in the project, we want to know what that role is in the project. When the project finishes, we want to know that there is a new project for us and we want to know <laughs> what our role is in that project. Your client wants to know when the project finishes and how much money it's going to cost, etc., etc. A lot of what we do is driven by certainty. People have a need to know, they have a need for certainty. 
But there is an opposite need because if I gave you all the certainty you needed and could tell you from now on in the next 12 months exactly what would happen, you'd be completely bored. So we don't want 100% certainty, we definitely also need variety. Some of your team members need a lot of variety, others don't. How can you give your team members, um, how can you help your team members fulfill these needs? Well, certainty is something you can help them fulfill by giving them clear role descriptions, for instance, and provide clarity about what you expect from them. Variety is something you can give them by not having the same person do the same role all, all the time, by rotating them. And, and I think project work inherently has a lot of variety, unless you're working on a long, long, long-term project where people do the same thing over and over again. The third need I want to talk to you about is significance. We all have a need to stand out, to be noticed, to be praised, um, to be unique, and there are many different ways that we can get that fulfilled. If I have a great title of program director, I may feel significant. If I have a lot of people report to me, I may also feel significant. Or if I drive a certain type of car or wear certain kinds of clothing. That's another way I can feel significant. So we have different strategies for making that need be fulfilled. As a project management leader, you can help people fulfill this need by praising them when they've done a great job. Not just saying, well done, well done, but being specific about the things they do really well. That will make them grow. And the fourth need, which is slightly opposed to significance, is belonging. As much as we want to stand out and be unique and be recognized for our own contributions, we also need to belong to the group. We need to connect with other people. Yeah, We are tribal as, um, as people. We, we live in, in families. We belong to a nation. We are part of work teams. We are part of uh, sports teams. Uh, we have a social circle. Everything we do really evolves around these tribes. And the work team we belong to is very important as well. Some people have a big need here, whereas others, others have less of a need for belonging. But we all have it. You can help your team members to belong by um, doing social events or by having team meetings, not just team meetings, but something that binds them together in that team meeting by, by doing something together, by having a name for your team, uh, or by celebrating successes, or even when you plan collaboratively, will make them feel they belong in a team. So there are many ways we, we can get this one fulfilled. I um, um, worked with a very senior team of architects earlier in the year. And uh, they were preparing to um, to to um, submit a bit a big bid um, for a, for a big building in London, and they'd never worked together before, and they were very senior, and um, it was a bit awkward for them to to form a team. And I worked with them to create the sense of belonging. And what we did was we did a little um, fun exercise. It's called the Marshmallow Challenge. You can look it up on Google, where you ask them to um, really work together and um, uh, create a, um, a tower out of spaghetti and marshmallows. And it was so much fun. And, and these very experienced um, architects were jump standing on the table at the end and trying to make this spaghetti tower stand. And it really made them gel in a way that I think we couldn't have done if we'd just been talking. So really consider things you can do to um, create that team spirit, not just at the beginning of the project, but throughout. However, it's the last two of these six needs that uh, we really need to pay special attention to. Um, their growth and contribution. Because from the first four needs, um, significance, certainty, variety, belonging, it's really hard to create a true fulfillment. Because certainty, we can never give anyone 100% certainty because we really live in an uncertain world. And significance, well, you can always find someone who's more significant than you. But growth and contribution are really important needs that can help us 
um, gain that true fulfillment. Growth means that we all have a need to grow, to develop, to learn, um, to do new things, to learn new technologies, to work on new projects, to feel that we're getting somewhere, um, to feel that we're expanding. Yeah, we're moving forward and not backwards. You can help your team members to grow by giving them new skills, by helping them become better team members, by helping them work on new technology. There's so many ways in which people can grow. What's important is that you help people grow in the way that they would like to grow. And contribution is a really overlooked factor on many projects, I feel. Contribution is about um, seeing how the project they're working on contribute to, let's say, making the world a better place. All projects are contributing. All projects have a value add, even in banking, because if you create a, a, a good project in, in finance, um, it helps people probably to, let's say, um, borrow money. Small businesses borrow more money so that they can go on and do cool things in the, in, in the world. So everything is connected. If, if you work on, on creating buildings, well, there's some people who are going to work in those buildings or live in these buildings. And every project has a value add, and we need to make that value add clear to our team so that they feel that they help contribute to something that is bigger than themselves. So this is really an overview of the six human needs. You have these six human needs. Three of them in particular are going to be dominant for you. And these three dominant needs are going to determine many of the decisions you make in your life and on your projects. The same goes for your team members. In your team, all of these six human needs will be present, meaning that you really need to cater for all of them. Are you giving people enough clarity and certainty in your team? Are you helping your team members grow? Are you creating that sense of belonging for those who need it? Is there enough variety? Do you make people see how they can contribute and do they see that link? Do you make people feel significant? Yeah, so you need, I would say, first of all, to understand what your top three needs are. You can take a screenshot of this slide and come back to it in your own time after this webinar. What are your top three needs? How do you seek to satisfy them? If you understand that, you will understand more about the kind of leader you are. But then, take another view of this model of these six human needs. What are the top needs of your team members? And how are you helping your team members satisfying these six human needs? This goes very deep, and, and there are many different ways to answer the question of what you can do to satisfy the needs, but I think having awareness around this um, really gives you another angle into um, leadership. This is definitely not management. This is definitely in the people side, in unleashing the individual's potential. So I really urge you to take a screenshot of this page, come back to it, and, and spend some time considering these questions on your own. I also encourage you to look up Dan Pink's videos. So there are two videos I will recommend. Now Dan Pink, or Daniel Pink, is the author of the book Drive. And he's also done a short animation video. As you can see there, it's about just under 11 minutes. You can uh, Google it on YouTube, or just go to YouTube and, and look, at, look for it. Um, you can type in RSA Animate. Dry, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. It's a video by Dan Pink. Dan Pink has also done a TED Talk, um, which, is, uh, highly which I highly recommend. He talks about purpose, mastery, and autonomy as the three drivers uh, for, people's, uh, for people to feel more fulfilled. It's a very thought-provoking little video, and, and his TED Talk is excellent. And um, I really recommend that you check them out. So let's now spend a little bit of time talking about high-performing teams. And I wonder if you have ever been fortunate enough to work in some high-performing teams. And if you're able to um, um, shall we say, understand the factors that created that high performance. 
why was the team high performing? Was it because of each person's individual skills? Was it because of the leader? Was it because of the environment? What was it? I think many people have not been so fortunate to work in a high performing team because it actually takes quite a bit to create it. So let's look at some of the things that help create high performing teams. There has been a variety of studies on this topic, in particular by Google. Google, I have been told, has a whole department allocated to studying performance. And at Google, they researched all their teams to see what the correlation was between different aspects and high performance. So, for instance, was there a correlation between high performing teams and uh, how much money they were being paid, whether people knew each other outside work, uh, whether people were co-located or not. Um, they looked at all different kinds of correlations and they could not find a link, right? They couldn't find a, 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 an explanation for high performing teams from those factors, but what they could find was that they could see, they could observe a high performing team. So when they saw a high performing team, they could recognize it because everybody in the team tended to contribute in equal amounts. So if you have a team uh, with five members, it's not just three of those team members who are contributing and talking all the time, it's all five. So they said, okay, if all team members in a high-performing team contribute equally, how come? What is it that makes them all contribute equally? And they came to this um, phenomenon that is called psychological safety. They found that in a team where everybody contributes, there is psychological safety, meaning that everybody in the team feels safe to contribute. So I am not being criticized when I come forward with my ideas. I am being respected and I feel safe enough to come out of my shell. That was the main factor. And then they looked at, but how come then that some teams um, have this psychological safety and other teams don't? And that's what came down to social sensitivity. Um, social sensitivity means that everybody in the team is sensitive to each other. And that really has a strong link with emotional intelligence and empathy that we saw earlier on in the webinar. When, and, and, and here it's important to mention that the leader of the team, which might be your role, really is important to help put this in place. So as a leader, I can be the first one to foster social sensitivity it means that at the end of a meeting, if two members haven't said anything, I will go, so Paul, what do you think of this idea? And um, Jane, we would really like to hear your contributions too. So as a leader, I have an important role in making everybody feel safe enough and be sensitive to the feelings and emotions of my team members so that they will come forward with their contributions. Yeah, it's about creating that safe environment. We can go a little bit further with high performing teams and look at some, well in this case, three fundamental elements that must be in place if you want to build a high performing team. We start with a mutual trust, which is very closely linked to psychological safety that we just saw in the previous slide. Mutual trust is really about vulnerability. It's about vulnerability-based trust. That means that in the team, we trust each other. Uh, we can be vulnerable to, uh, together, meaning that we can open up and admit that we're not perfect. As a leader, I can say, I don't know the answer. Or I can say, I need help. I need help with this. That's what we mean by vulnerability-based trust. And it is that mutual trust that will create um, 
well, I would say it links back to the psychological safety that we just talked about. We all trust each other that we're safe, that we can contribute, and that this is not going to be used against me. So trust is an absolute fundamental building block for high performance. Only when you have that kind of vulnerability-based trust can you begin to gain commitment from everybody, mutual commitment. That means we commit to each other, and the way to build that is to get people to weigh in to decisions. If I, as a leader, make all the decisions, I'm not going to get commitment from my team. I need people to to, to participate. This is where we can do collaborative planning and I ask lots of questions and I say, you know, how do you want to do it and what do you think the right way is and what are your ideas? And um, we're only then able to commit based on trust and based, based on this collaboration. Only then are we able to get mutual accountability. Yeah, because I'm only, I'm only going to be accountable if I've committed. Yeah, otherwise, um, that's not going to happen. And I work with many teams and project managers who say, my teams just, they, they don't commit and they're not accountable. You know, I need a bigger stick. But it's not about the bigger stick. It really goes straight, comes straight back to emotional intelligence, building trust based on vulnerability, engaging everybody, making everybody weigh in so that they commit, and only then can we ask for them to be accountable. But as a leader, you also need to hold people to account. This is something that many people struggle with. And I'm not just talking about holding people to account if something isn't done the way you, uh, if a deliverable isn't delivered. I'm also talking about behaviors. So if some people in the team are, um, are displaying behaviors that are not OK, you need to be able to bring that up. That's very important. Don't don't just push things or uh, hide things under the carpet. That's not definitely not going to help. So we have here some top tips. It's a little bit of a summary of some of the things you can do when you work with a team, or when you want to to create that high performing team. You definitely need to agree team goals, and um, we need a common goal. Otherwise, I mean, it's, it's self explanatory, really. We also need common ways of working together, and I'm really a big fan of setting ground rules. Ground rules with post-it notes. So ask each member in the team to write down something on a post-it note that's important for them. Um, it could be it's important for me we all turn up on time, or it's important for me that we all listen to each other with respect. All of the collective post-it notes becomes the team's collective ground rules. You should not set the ground rules as a, as a project manager. It should be everybody in the team. Show vulnerability, as we talked about, and embrace conflict. Conflict is good, because if you trust each other, then we trust each other enough, and we feel safe in the team, that we can discuss this conflict um, in a constructive way. We're not afraid, you know, it's not going to break us. We need to explore conflict and get the, get the best from it. You need to include all team members, and this is again where I keep referring back to collaborative, collaborative planning, collaborative risk management. Don't feel you have to do it all as a project manager. Client. Yeah, there's four elements here. Um, and, and trust is a big and very important topic. Competence. Of course you need to be competent in order for your client to trust you. That's not normally where project managers struggle. You need to be able to connect and empathize with your client. Again, this ties back with what we talked about before. Emotional intelligence, being able to empathize with others, feel what other people are feeling, seeing the situation from others' point of view. Your client wants to know that you understand them, that you connect with them, that you look them in the eyes, that you listen to them. That is something that really builds trust. Honesty, you've got to be reliable. Do not overpromise. Talk openly about risks and issues with your client. Of course, tell them what you're going to what you're going to do about them. So you must make realistic promises. I feel many project managers fall down on this one because they overpromise and 
then it comes across as if they're not being honest. And lastly, clear communication. You've got to communicate clearly for your client to trust you. Keep people informed. Um, um, if there is an issue that crops up, make it clear what the options are and what the impact of each option is and, and tailor your communication to um, the client you're speaking to, maybe one of your clients like you to call them on the phone, so that's what you'll do. Another client prefers to see you face to face, so that's what you'll do. Another client likes emails with bullets, so that's how you should adapt your communication. So this is just a very quick overview on how you can begin to build trust with your client. So we're building up to our Q&A soon, um, but before we get to the Q&A, I just briefly want to share with you um, this frog. Why, why, is, why is there a frog on my slide? Well, Brian Tracy is an American management consultant who has written a book called Eat That Frog. Um, the frog is a metaphor for the ugly task that most of us are procrastinating on. And the reason why that's relevant in this webinar is that I have now given you quite a few tips and tools and hints to how you can become a project management leader, how you can develop your emotional intelligence, how you can connect better with your team, and how you can begin to build high performance. There's so much to do, right? And we tend to procrastinate on this. So in order to help you free up some time to be a better leader, to listen more to your team members, to do collaborative planning, we need to really eat frogs. And as I said before, the frog is the ugly task that you are procrastinating on. What Brian Tracy says is that you should start your day eating the most ugly frog. So just get it over and done with. Just do those um, ugly tasks early in the day. Just get them done. Because if you start your day eating frogs, so if you start your day with 90 minutes of clear focus, let's say, then nothing bad can happen to you for the rest of the day. You've done all the good stuff, or the hard stuff, then it's okay if the rest of your day is taken up by meetings or by interruptions. But please, you must find time in your day um, where you can work uninterruptedly on important stuff, yeah? On those things that will make you a leader. Um, if you just are being taken over by emails and, and urgent uh, stuff all day, you are just a manager running around and, and being reactive. You really need to take control of your day, um, eat frogs in the morning, set time aside where you can work uninterruptedly on important stuff, and um, that's a good basis for really becoming a project management leader. And remember, remember to ask for feedback. I am now going to hand over to um, our administrator who will list some questions for us. Uh, in the meantime, I, I've hoped that you have captured some of the questions in the chat box for us. If you haven't, there is still time to capture your questions. I would invite you to connect with me on, um, on LinkedIn and uh, on Twitter. My Twitter name, it hasn't quite come through here on this slide, I'm not sure what happened, but my Twitter name is simply my name, Suzanne Matson. It's the same as my website. And of course, I invite you to check out my books, the Project Management um, Coaching Workbook and the Power of Project Leadership. They are available on um, Amazon, and you can see the, uh, the nice reviews as well on Amazon. So I'm handing over, and we will um, see what the questions are. Thank you, Suzanne, for this very informative uh, presentation. Before we proceed with the question and answer session, I would like to inform you that PCB provides training and certification services for ISO 21500 Introduction, Foundation, Lead Project Manager, and Lead Auditor. ISO 21500 helps you in delivering projects successfully and ensuring a sustainable future. A PCB certificate will demonstrate your dedication in implementing and managing these processes and frameworks, and most importantly, you will be recognized. Now, without further ado, we will read some of the questions from attendees regarding today's presentation. The first question is, is there a difference in the approach for leading a young team member and senior team members? 
That's an interesting question. I think there is a difference in approach, but only insofar that there is always a difference in approach with all team members. So we've looked at the six human needs, we've looked at um, what motivates people, what do people want more of, less of. Everybody is motivated differently. So I don't think there is an age difference per se. We always need to adapt our approach to different people, not to look at stereotypes. So not assuming that a man needs to be led differently from a woman or a young person needs to be led differently from uh, to, um, you know, a young to an older person. You know, I train all over the world. I've recently been to Malaysia twice to run training and I felt that in Malaysia I connected better with the team than I did with some teams in Europe. So I think we often build up stereotypes. I think the truth is if we develop our emotional intelligence, if we tune into the people in front of us in the team, in, 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 in the room, it doesn't matter um, age, color, uh, sex or culture really, then we automatically adapt to the person in front of us. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, what qualities are most important for a project manager to be an effective project leader? What qualities to be a leader? I think they're actually maybe a summary of what this webinar was all about. Um, the qualities are um, emotional intelligence. So we spend a lot of time looking at emotional intelligence. I would also refer back to the first slide I showed um, on the differences between management and leadership. So a leader um, asks lots of questions and if you're interested in exploring this more, I've got lots of um, blog posts and of course my, my books, but I have many blog posts that specifically deal with these topics. Um, so the quality is asking good questions, uh, definitely important. Asking for feedback, you know, most leaders ask for feedback. Do not shy away from that. Definitely invite feedback. Um, listen, you know, I, I, I ran, I've been running leadership workshops with many project managers. When they come back the second time and we ask them, so what have you changed in your approach since our first uh, workshop? Many of them say, I just have started listening more to people asking more open questions and really being present when people come into my office and ask me questions. So um, it's a very big top, uh, it's a very big question, but I think I've, I've given you some of the main, main answers. Yes, thank you. So another question is how to manage a boss that has no consideration for his or her team and does not seek for their input or welfare in building team bonding? <sighs> Wow, that's, um, that's a question I sometimes hear. So your boss is not a good leader, your boss is cutting people off. And um, actually, I, my, my last blog post last month was about how to coach your, your, your manager. Um, I, I, so there are different, different ways I can answer this question. I know that some people uh, leave a book anonymously on their boss's desk, a book that can help him or her um, gain better better skills. Um, but really I think you can give your manager feedback and I think you can coach your manager. It has to obviously be done very sensitively. But um, you can sow seeds with your manager um, to give your manager some good ideas that are really your ideas but you make it look like it's your manager's ideas. So um, you can say to your manager, oh I wonder how we can um, Oh, I wonder how we can create better communication in the team, or do you have any good ideas? Or um, So you really come to your manager with some problems that you apparently don't know how to resolve and, and your manager can begin to, um, to, to help brainstorm on ideas and, and slowly change their perception. I mean, working for a, for a boss who has no consideration for, for a team is, is never easy. Um, you could also give your manager some some feedback. Most organizations have um, year-end reviews and um, that should be an opportunity for both people to, to give feedback. If you give feedback, um, you can do it in a layered way. So you always have to then give your manager some uh, positive feedback as well. So say, you know, 
I really appreciate, and it has to be something you honestly appreciate about them. You can say, I really appreciate how organized you are with, with our work, or them. I'm sure there's something that you appreciate about them. And you could say, one way that I'm considering um, we could make even better use of, of your skills and my team would be if you blah, 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 did something. You, this is your feedback piece for them. But you can give the feedback in a way that it makes it sound like it's a way that would definitely benefit them. Um, so, for instance, if your manager is very micromanaging with the team, you could say, you know, we feel that surely um, with your talents there would be a better way of using your talents. So we feel that we could, um, if, if you didn't, sorry, if, if we set our boundaries clearer and we made it clear what you expected from us, I'm sure that the team could run with it. So I'm, I'm not formulating this very well, but but um, giving feedback to your manager in a sensitive way, making it sound like there is advantages for your manager in maybe spending less time with the team. I would also say if you make uh, set up clearer expectations with your manager in advance about what he or she is expecting, you should be able to keep that manager at bay a little bit more, so keep them at a distance by making sure that they get what they need from you. So you can ask your manager, for instance, in which way would you like us to report to you? In which way would you like us to um, escalate to you if there's an issue? So really be sure that you have those rules of engagement, if you like, very clearly set out between you. Because if you do, then hopefully your boss will be less involved. So that's another way. Just, just uh, make sure they're less involved, really. Thank you, Suzanne. Because of the time limitation, we will only be answering one more question, while some of the remaining, one, remaining ones will be answered by Suzanne via email. So the question is, how do you mitigate problems when your team has agreed on the project deadlines and objectives and management does not agree? Okay, could you say that again? How do you mitigate, say it again? How do you mitigate problems when your team has agreed on the project deadlines and objectives and management does not agree? Okay, so um, I'm not sure how you can mitigate it, but it's a problem, it's an issue, right? If, if yeah. your team comes up with a, with a plan and your management does not agree, one way that the team can work around that is by looking very carefully, I think, at what, the, what buffers they put into the planning. So making their assumptions very clear. Um, I, can also, I would also say for a team, um, come up with three different options, come up with three different plans, and say, you know, plan number one, there is um, X amount of buffer in it. Uh, we feel it is highly risky. We do not recommend this plan. We feel that all these risks could happen, all these issues could happen with it. Um, plan number two, we have a little bit more buffer in it. We have made these assumptions. Um, these are the risks involved with the plan. This is the likelihood that we'll hit the plan. Option number three, that made the plan you're recommending. recommending. There is more buffer in it. and um, you know, it's more likely you're going to hit it. Your management team can then choose. They might go for the second plan, although it's not the one you recommended, but at least you've, you've laid out what the risks are involved and you've avoided that they choose the most aggressive plan. So that's one way of doing it, making your assumptions very clear, making all the, you know, risks clear and the likelihood that there will be delays if you're not allowed to put in some buffer in the plan. Another way you can do it, sorry, I know we're running out of time, but another way you can do it um, which I favor, is to only estimate um, the first part of the project. So say we need a discovery phase, let's work for two months or whatever it is on this discovery phase. Only after the discovery phase where we have all the requirements um, clarified and we've done some proof of concepting, are we in fact able to come up with the plan for the rest of the project? So that's another way to mitigate the risks because as a team you will have a much better view of the entire project after you've done that discovery phase or initiation phase if you've done some proof of concepting etc. Um, yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you once again for this presentation Suzanne. It was an honor having you as our presenter. I would also like to thank all of the attendees for taking the time out of their busy schedule and joining us today. Please be reminded that this webinar will be recorded and posted in our YouTube channel and also in our SlideShare account. We hope you enjoyed our webinar and we wish you a wonderful day.